day. We're here at Kingsorb, just west of Toowoomba, looking at the mung bean crop and how to grow a mung bean crop in our environment up here in the northern region. We will look at different strategies today about soil preparation, land preparation, you're looking at insects, you're looking at nutrition, and we're looking at the harvesting angles. Yes, we grow them in dry lands and they get really tough times and people don't like them and they get halfway up machines, but these days, this short rotation crop of mung beans is becoming like a pillar crop. And by a pillar crop, I mean that people really set up the land preparation and everything they do with it to grow mung bean. Let's look at a bit more detail about how we can grow a successful mung bean in this northern region. With me today is Jane Gentry from Department of Ag and Fisheries. Thanks Paul, and like you said, setting up the mung bean crop right from the start is so important. In the past, I think people have considered mung beans to be an opportunity crop. It rains, let's stick them in the ground. But like what we've been learning and working with the growers, it's actually really planning ahead for your mung bean crop. Knowing where you're gonna put them in your farming system, within your rotation, never grow mung beans after mung beans. And normally don't grow a pulse crop after a pulse crop. Mung beans fit in really well if you're coming out of that cereal, winter cereal or even summer cereal crops. What's your take on the amount of plant available water we need for our mung beans? Well, I guess in the past we thought mung beans didn't actually root very deep into the soil, but we've now, with current research, we know that they will actually root down below 60 centimetres. We've detected mung bean roots right down below a metre. So if they are sourcing water below that metre, they're also sourcing nutrients below that metre. They need water. We want mung beans to yield well. If we're getting yields over 1.25 tonnes, so one and a quarter tonnes per hectare, you're going to be needing about 200 millimetres of plant available water. So that means going into your paddock when you've got a full profile, but we know mung beans like rain in crop as well. Jane, we talk about plant available water and this crop has obviously had a good amount of water in it because we tested it beforehand and we had that 110, 120 millimetres of plant available water. What do you think of the crop now compared to the water we had? Well, it's, it was set up really, really well. That's exactly right. But we had 150 millimetres of rain about two weeks ago. And anyone who's grown mung beans, we know they like in crop rain. They need in crop rain to really push those yields beyond that one into two and above tonnes. It is really important to soil test before you put your mung beans in. You need to take a soil test right down to 90 centimetres to a metre into your soil to understand the whole spectrum of nu nutrition right throughout that profile. So the sorts of things that you need to be looking at are nitrogen, phosphorus, zinc and potassium. They're probably the four key things if you're looking at a soil test. So get in there and soil test before you plant. Young bean draws very heavily on phosphorus and potassium. We always recommend if you're planting a mung bean crop, you need to be putting starter fertiliser down with that mung bean crop. Mung beans are possibly one of the most finicky plants when it comes to high levels of sodicity. So when you're taking your soil test, consider where those high levels of sodicity are. Anything over 6% exchangeable sodium percentage is a problem for mung beans. One of the things that we recommend people doing is doing what we call a predictor B test. So this is a predictor B probe. It actually just is a stock probe that you can actually take a zero to 30 centimetre core out of your soil. So the sorts of things that you do when you do a predictor B analysis of this soil is you're looking at some of the main pathogens in our soil as well as some of the good guys like AMF. So the pathogens that you'd have a look for in a mung bean crop are nematodes. So there's two types of nematodes, but the main nematode that is an issue in mung beans is Predilecus thornii. So numbers, high numbers of Predilecus thornii will significantly reduce yield in your mung beans. We all know mung beans are a legume and mung beans will nodulate, which means if they nodulate well, they'll be able to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. But what, one of the things you need to consider when you are doing your soil testing is how much nitrogen is in your soil. Because we know 
and it doesn't matter what legume you're talking about, if there is nitrogen, readily available nitrogen in the soil, the legumes will use that nitrogen as opposed to nodulating and fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere. So if you have really high levels of concentration in your soil, the mung beans will not nodulate. But, that, but generally speaking, we still recommend that people need to inoculate their mung beans. So one of the best ways to assess nodulation is get into the paddock and dig some plants up. Make sure that you do dig them up with a shovel, get as much of the root system as you possibly can. Washing them will actually just really carefully remove that dirt. So you can see here, these plants actually are not very well nodulated at all. You can't see very many obvious nodules. So we're trying to find the insects, both beneficials and the bad guys. And it's just a simple matter of tucking the beech seed under the bottom of the base of the plants and then using a nice big stick out here, beating the mung bean plants quite solidly to dislodge those insects onto the yellow beech sheet and hey presto, you've got green veggie bugs. One of the things, you've got a ladybird there, which is a good guy. You've probably got, you've got a Heliothus armidra there, which is a bad guy. There's a mixture of good and bad, isn't there? The whole secret is dislodging those insects off here, onto here, a nice yellow beet sheet, easy to count them, you can take a note of it, make a, a sum total when you get out of the paddock. Hey presto, is it a spray decision or not? It's one of the most difficult decisions about when to desiccate your mung beans. And for years we had that policy or all the, the labels were reading 90% black pod. We know that's way too late. We went 90% physiological material, the seed in the black pod is the key. And that's usually well in advance. Desiccation we're talking about, of course, is you know killing the crop so our harvesters can harvest it successfully. We know that our mung bean quality harbors on a good desiccation. We know that our mung bean quality harbors on a, a good harvester setup. We don't want green stalks or green stems or even green parts of the plant in the head of the to muck up that quality of the mung beans we're producing. Desiccation, the rules are, use the right chemicals, the ones that are registered, don't go over the rates, use it at the correct time is another important part, and then have the header properly set up, ready to go on the edge of the paddock, so when those beans become nice and dry and those stems become nice and dry, that's when you put the header in there to get the high quality mung beans that our overseas countries so much want. We can't produce enough good quality mung beans for our customers overseas. High quality mung beans, we've got a market for them. They'll pay for them, we've just got to be able to produce them all the time.